I want you to turn to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Today we're going to continue our series of messages entitled Authentic Faith. We're in week three of this series. I thought we were going to do three. We're actually going to do four. So we have another one coming. But we have talked about the faith of Abraham in the first week. This uh, last week, we, we talked about living between the errors of Jacob and Gideon because they had some errors in their faith. And, and, and Jacob needed to learn to trust and Gideon needed to learn to obey. And so we learned about living a life of faith that includes trust and obedience. We've, we've already talked a lot about trust today. Trust is one thing. Obedience is the other side of the coin. Because when we trust, then that helps us to obey. Well, today I want to talk about now faith. Now faith. And I want to begin by reading one of the most well-loved, uh, well-known verses of Scripture concerning faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. This is the only verse we're going to read today. Hebrews 11, 1. And many of you know this. You could quote it from by heart. And this is what it says. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then in the next 39 vo- verses, in, in, the, in the 40 verses of Hebrews chapter 11, after verse 1, faith is mentioned 25 times by my count. The, the, the chapter is a chapter of faith. Some people have referred to it as the Faith Hall of Fame because of all the great Old Testament characters that are listed there and it tells about their faith. Uh, it, it is like the Hall of Faith. So I want to talk about faith today. Before we do, would you bow your head and let's just pray together and ask for the Lord's help. Heavenly Father, I just pray that your spirit, God, in the next few moments will open our hearts. I pray, God, that you would quicken our hearts and our minds to be able to hear what you're saying to us. God, this word is not just for someone else, that someone needs to hear it. But God, there's something you want to say to each one of us. So I pray, God, that you would open our minds and our spirits to the the power of your life-changing word. Do what you want to do. Say what you want to say. And I pray, God, that you would encourage people and that you would would, uh, help us to grow in faith today. And we believe you for all of this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. I want you to use your imagination for a moment and, and frankly, to enter into a terrible imagination. Just let yourself imagine for a moment uh, the, the, this, this, this scenario. This is not a good imagination. This is a bad imagination. But imagine that you're sitting in a doctor's office and you've gone through all the examinations and all the tests. And the doctor walks up to you and he says, step into my office for a few moments. Let, let me talk to you. And you sit there waiting to hear the results. And the kindly old doctor clasps his hands together, leans over the desk and says, it's everything I feared. It's everything I feared. There's absolutely absolutely nothing we can do. Apart from a miracle of God, you have only a few months to live. Can you get into that imagination for a moment without it devastating you? All right, now come back out of that imagination. And here's the question I want to ask you. How would you face that moment for yourself and for others? How would you pray and how would you want others to pray? You see, that scenario moves faith from some theoretical realm uh, to uh, to faith in the practical reality. You you learned the definition of faith in Sunday school when you were a kid. What we just read from Hebrews 11.1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. seen. But however, what, what about in that moment? What does faith mean in that moment? What about right then? When the devastation and the fear and the loneliness and the depression just crash in on you and you're trying to figure out how you're going to tell your family, how are you going to face this, how are you going to get through this, will you get a miracle, will you get a healing, what will happen? In that moment, faith is no longer in the theoretical realm. Faith is out of the Sunday school definition realm. Now it's where you are in that doctor's office, in the car alone, on the way home, and in the next few months of your life. You know, I'm coming to believe more and more that we have done ourselves a terrible disservice over the last 30 or 40 years in this country and in the kingdom elsewhere by making faith a spiritual commodity that you have faith. And I'm coming to believe more and more that we that we should be thinking about doing faith 
rather than having faith. There are two ways to read Hebrews 11.1. 1. One is to read the way we normally do, and it's probably the grammatically correct, where we say, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. However, today, just for the sake of what we want to talk about today, what if you read it this way? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Not yesterday faith, not tomorrow faith, not someday faith, but now faith. I want now faith, faith for right now, faith in this moment. And I'm not telling you that that's the, the way the passage should be taking, but I do believe that now faith is, is an operative faith. Now faith is an active faith. And as we talk about faith this morning, I don't want to approach it from the standpoint of faith as a spiritual commodity, you know, to have faith. Uh, faith is a mustard seed, faith for salvation. There's nothing wrong with those ideas. Those are biblical ideas. But what I want to talk about today is where the rubber meets the road. I want to talk about how do you deal with reality in faith? How do you deal with real life in faith right now? Facing what you're facing right now. What I, want to, I want to give you some thoughts today on this. The first one is this. Now faith concentrates first and above all things on who God is now in this situation with me. Now faith concentrates first and above all things on who God is now in this situation with me. Now faith concentrates on the reality that, 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 that this situation is not what the doctor has told me. It's not what my emotions are telling me. It's not what I'm feeling. Now, those things are all real and they're in my face. Uh, they're in my emotions. I'm dealing with them. However, now faith has to be all about who God is now. Not who God was in the Old Testament. Not who God was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not who God was on the cross. Who is God now, now I'm not discounting any of those things. Don't misunderstand me, but I have to believe that no matter what I'm facing, no matter what I'm dealing with, no matter what devastation or hardship or loneliness or fear or rejection, I, ha I have to know that God is God now in my life. In other words, if I am well in my body, it doesn't make God a good God. And if I'm sick in my body, it doesn't make God an uncaring God. God is God now. He is unchanging, immortal, eternal, perfect, holy love. So the first thing I have to do is ex to exercise now faith toward the reality of the, uh, 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 the goodness of God in this moment. I exercise now faith to understand that my painful circumstances do not change who God is. That's where we start. We, we begin with that because in that moment in the doctor's office, you cannot face uh, the, your, your relationship with God and saying, well, God, where are you? What, what, what's going on? I thought you were a healer. You have to know God is still God and that my circumstances, when something bad happens, when something tragic happens, I have to know that it has not changed who God is one iota. God is God and he is good. Now, even in this moment. The second thing about now faith is this. Now faith is operative in those things that I cannot see as though they were real. Hebrew tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, substance means what I can touch or feel substantial rather than like steam or gas or something like that. It has, it's something that has substance. So faith says, I can't hold this in my hand, but faith makes it as real as if it were in my hand. Faith is the substance of it. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Faith says, I can't see these things, but I have evidence, therefore I believe. I have this witness of the Holy Spirit giving evidence that it is real. So I have to get into the promise of God now in whatever I'm facing. And listen, if you can't grasp that, you can't be saved. Because this kind of faith is the only thing that makes any of us Christians. Let me, here's what I mean. None of us have ever seen the blood on the mercy seat. 
None of us has ever seen the cross. None of us has ever seen the resurrected Christ. We have not put our fingers in the scars of his, of his hand. We have not thrust our hand into the, the wounded side of Jesus. You know, Jesus said to Thomas, you believe because you have touched these nail scars, but uh, because you put your hand in my side, but blessed are those who believe and have not seen. Now faith says that in the moment of salvation, it says, I believe Jesus died. I believe he was raised. I believe he is ruling. I believe that he is returning. And I believe these things, even though I have never seen them, they're as real to me as if I touched them. So we operate by faith for salvation. Now faith, in that moment of devastation and bad news and hardship, has to operate in the same way. I know who God is, and I still believe that God is on the case for me, that he's undertaking for me, that he has good in mind for me, that he is powerful. I have faith that he has power to heal. I have faith in his goodness. I have faith in his love. I have, I'm going to operate in faith. I'm going to step into faith. It's not just, I'm just not going to let faith sort of float around me like a cloud. So faith is in the goodness of God, and faith is operative in those things that I cannot see as though they were real. But listen, all that's good, all that's wonderful, but this is where things get a little dicier for us when it comes to faith now in the moment. Sometimes faith says, as Job did, though he should slay me, still I will serve him. See, faith works itself out in our lives in different ways. Sometimes faith says, I know that God is going to heal me, and I'm going to step uh, out on that. I'm going to claim that. I'm going to stand on that. God has revealed to me that I'm going to be healed. I'm going to get this miracle. I'm, I'm going to get this wonder. God is going to do this. And sometimes faith goes in that direction. But sometimes faith says, I don't know what God is going to do. It's not clear to me. God hasn't revealed to me. Either I'm too blind to see it or I'm too deaf to hear it. But even though I cannot see it, I don't know what God is going to do. I do know who my Redeemer is. And listen, what we have to know is that neither of those is better or worse faith than the other. The person who hears from God and stands on that promise and says, I know God's going to do this, it has, does not have greater faith than the person who says, I don't know what God's going to do, but I stand fast in him because I know him who, in whom I have believed. You know, I told this story before. I know I've told it on a Wednesday night. I don't know if I've told it on a Sunday morning about an evangelist who had a young college boy who traveled with him to lead the singing at some revival services that he was having in the hills of North Georgia, and it was a cold, cold January night. There, there was a highway on the way home that went right around the, the edge of a dam at the end of a, a lake, and the, the wind during this winter storm, it was, it was just howling across there. And of course, you know, Murphy's Law, they got a flat, flat tire right there in the middle of that road. Ice was freezing on the road, it was freezing on the windshield, and they got out there and they popped open the trunk. They grabbed the spare and they got the jack out and they, they popped that tire iron on the lug nuts, but they were just absolutely frozen. It, it, it was uh, one of those star lug, nut, uh, lug wrenches. You know what I'm talking about? The four-way lug wrenches that gives you the different sizes. And those are great because they give you a lot more leverage. And they put that on there and, and they were stuck so bad that that the college student was pressing down on one side and the evangelist, evangelist was pulling up on the other side, but, uh, but they, those lug nuts would not budge. They just would not budge. They would not break loose. And their hands were freezing. Neither one of them had gloves. Neither one of them had overcoats. They just stood there in their suit coats and they were just, it was freezing cold and the wind was blowing, just cutting right through them. And they were both freezing and those lug nuts would not move. Finally, the college student got on one side of the lug, lug wrench and, and jumped up and down while the evangelist pulled up on the other side, and they still did not move. They were frozen. It was like they were soldered shut. That's how hard they, they were frozen. Well, the evangelist was getting more and more frustrated. The wind was getting colder and colder, and their noses were running, and their eyes were stinging. And finally, that college kid said, you know, I just realized we haven't prayed. And that evangelist in his frustration 
and listen, you've been there in your frustration. He just wanted to slap him. You, anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, he's like, well, you pray, you pray, pray then. You know, the thing is, when you're cold and your hands are frozen, there's just nothing more horrible than somebody getting all spiritual and Christian on you. So he said, fine, fine, of course, you, you pray. Well, that kid just put one knee down on that frozen pavement, and all he said was, Lord, we are so cold. We are both going to get sick. God, will you please help us get this tire off? In Jesus' name, amen. And that evangelist heard that, and he thought, well, I could have done that. He was thinking, what kind of prayer is that? That's, a, that's, not, a, that's not a great grand prayer of faith, and... And, he's, and he got, I was still frustrated. He just jerked that lug neck right out of the hands of the college student. And he said, give me that. And he, he put that on the first lug nut. And, and I'm telling you that those, those uh, nuts just spun off like they had never been tightened at all. And he, and he did it on the second one. They all of them spun off. In fact, he said that the last three, they actually took off with their fingers. Now, I know that somebody's going to say, well, sure, but you loosened them with all that stuff. But all he said is, well, they weren't loose before we prayed and they were loose after that guy prayed. And I say that that prayer of faith loosened those lug nuts. That young man's faith was operative in that moment. It, it was attacking that situation. It was now faith. It was faith enough to say, we need to ask God for help because I believe he's going to hear me. I believe that he's going to answer me. It wasn't faith in some kind of theoretical realm. It was now faith in that moment, in that crisis they were facing. See, you see, everybody wants to make the prayer of faith a formula. There's a lot of people who want to do that today. But the, the prayer of faith is just a prayer that you pray when you're operating in the now faith that God gives you in that moment. It's not about, you know, suddenly you get this strong urge, this strong emotion. It's like, ah, oh, I'm going to believe now. It's just that in that moment, you pray with whatever faith God has given you. And in that moment, that is now faith. You know, there was a uh, great old man of God who had been very active in evangelism, active in missions. He took people on missions trips and was involved in missions for years and years and years. And he had a great, great influence on many, many people. Well, he was stricken with cancer and a, a close friend who had, had sat under his ministry and had been mentored by him and had grown so much to him. He, he came to sit by his bedside during what was apparently the last few hours of his life. While they were there, another man came in to visit this older man and, and he said to him, God has revealed to me that if I lay this cloth on your chest, he would heal you. While I was on the way over here, God told me that if I lay this on your chest and say to you, thou shalt not die, but you shall live, that he'd heal you. He said, this will not end in death. And he put that cloth on him and he prayed at the top of his lungs. And, and when he finished praying, then he basically rebuked the old man for his lack of faith. He said, now, friend, be believe God. I just sense right now that you're not believing God. Stand with me on this. And he prayed again and he left. The old man was lying in his bed. His faith was, face was skeletal. His breathing was labored and shallow. The humidifier was running next to his bed to make his breathing a little bit easier. His wife was in the kitchen weeping. His boy, right out of college, was sitting by the bedside, confused, disoriented. The old man's friend, sitting there, didn't know what to make of all of that. And, he, he, and the old man just lay there with, his, with that cloth still lying on his chest. And finally, the old man looked at his friend and he said, you don't know what to think, do you? His friend said, I, that really confused me. The old man, lying on his back, took that cloth and he said, well, listen to me, son. Jesus revealed to me last night that I'm going to heaven before the sun comes up. He said, this man misunderstood God. It doesn't make him evil. It doesn't make him bad. It just makes him stupid. He said, I'm going to be in heaven tomorrow. I'm going to heaven. He said, and you know what? I, I'm not afraid. I don't feel lonely. I don't feel as if my prayers haven't been answered. I'm not disappointed with God. I'm going home. And he laid that cloth over on his bedside table and he squeezed his friend's hand and closed his eyes to rest. Eventually, that man's friend went home and then his wife called him around three o'clock in the morning and said, he's gone. 
Where is now faith in that moment? Where is now faith in that moment? You need to hear this. Because, you know, listen, I've often thought sometimes we pray harder to keep Christians out of heaven than we do to get sinners into heaven. But heaven is not the worst thing that can happen to a Christian. There are some really bad things that can happen to a Christian, but heaven is not one of them. Nevertheless, people often say in that moment, after they prayed and believed God, they say, what happened to our faith? What happened to our faith? Our old Uncle Fred has just served Jesus for 60 years. He was, lived a spirit-filled, holy life. He served God, and he came down with his heart disease, and we prayed, and we stood on the Word of God, and we prayed, and we believed by faith, but old Uncle Fred still passed away. You know, in essence, what we're doing is saying he's in heaven. He's in his glorified body. He's walking on streets of gold, living in mansions, seeing angels, looking on the face of Jesus. And we're so mad with God. What I'm trying to say is this. You have to walk this tightrope of faith. There's going to come that moment when you have a flat tire on a frozen road. Maybe not exactly this situation, but you're exposed to the biting wind. You don't have that sense of faith. You don't sense any miracle coming. You can't imagine that there's some sign. You don't feel spiritual in the moment. And then some nitwit college kid who's never been through anything in his life is going to say, I just feel like we ought to pray. And you'll say, I don't want to pray. And then the miracle comes and you think that didn't have anything to do with my faith. That wasn't about my faith. That was some college kid who was operating in now faith. Up on that road with that flat tire, his faith was operating in that moment. And then, my friend, let me tell you, before your life is over, and I'm not prophesying doom and gloom, I'm just telling you the truth. Before your life is over, somebody you know and love and care about, for whom you have prayed with what you believe is powerful faith, faith enough to even open up lug nuts, is they're going to die anyway. And, And if you get all puffed up with God and angry and say, oh, if he couldn't heal Uncle Fred, then he's not God. That's just blasphemous arrogance. Back to my original question. If that doctor says, there's nothing we can do, how are you going to pray? I tell you how I want to pray if that ever happens to me. It's, it's honestly, I believe it's pride to say what you would do because you don't know what you would do until it actually happens and you have to face that moment. However, I'll tell you what I hope I would do. I hope that I'm, that I would, that I'm going to believe that, that, that I can walk out of that, that, that doctor's office and say, there is, this is a great opportunity for one of two things to happen. I'm either going to show this heathen, unbelieving doctor how a Christian dies, or I'm going to show this heathen, unbelieving doctor how a Christian gets a miracle. And either one of those is okay with me. But right now, my vote is for the miracle. (laughs) I'm going to put now faith in action. That's what I want. I'm going to pray and I'm going to surround myself with people who are willing to pray with me in faith, that are willing to put their faith into action, that they're willing to put their faith with mine. I don't want people around me to condemn me, condemn me for my lack of faith or tell me that I'm sick because I have some hidden sin. I want people to put loving faith with mine and believe God for a miracle. I don't want doubters. I don't want naysayers. I don't want condemners. I want people who will put loving faith with mine and believe God for a miracle. However, if in that time of prayer, if God says, okay, Dave, I hear that, you, that prayer of faith, and I'm glad you prayed that because that's the way I want you to act when you're sick, but it's my will for you to come on home and be with me. In that case, I don't want people standing by my widow telling her that if she'd had enough faith, her husband would still be alive. See, this is tightrope walking. This, this is not going to be theory. In that moment when some weeping mother throws herself into your arms and says, I believed God and now my baby's dead. It's not theory anymore. It's, it's now faith. Now what does it mean? Now who is God in light of that moment? I'm just saying to you, I don't have all this sorted out and I don't frankly trust people who think they do. But what I do know is that there are times, these two branches, these two ways that faith works out, there are times to put your faith on the line, 
to believe God for a miracle, to speak it, to claim it, to receive it, to pray it, to stand on it. And you do that as substantially as if you were holding it in your hand and as clearly as if you'd heard witness and testimony given in a courtroom. And then there are times when you submit to the sovereign will of God and say, I know my Redeemer lives, and though He slay me, yet will I serve Him. I'm going to believe God right up, up to the last moment. I'm going to stand in miracle faith right up to the moment. Then I'm going to submit to the sovereign will of God. At least that's what I hope I'll do. Let me give you two examples of this, these types of faith. And then, and then I'm going to, uh, we're going to take some time and pray today. I heard Dr. Mark Rutland, one of uh, mentors in my life, share these two stories. And I, I think they illustrate what I'm talking about perfectly. So I want to just share his testimonies with you. When Dr. Rutland was growing up, he had hay fever so badly that every morning and of every spring and every fall, he would wake up. And if you've ever had these kind of allergies, you know what I'm talking about. He would wake up and his eyes would be caked with all that nasty yellow stuff. You know, his nose constantly ran, it went into asthma, it was very bad, it was constant and it was horrible. Every spring and every fall it happened and it hurt him in athletics when he was young and it hurt him in the ministry as he got older. Because you know, it just doesn't inspire confidence when the minister steps in the pulpit and says, uh, take your Bible <coughs> and, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you about faith, you know. He found a galling and humiliating and embarrassing. It was just debilitating. Well, one Sunday morning, he was praying before church service. He was at the time pastoring a Methodist church. He had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit just a few months earlier. And he was praying and he felt God say to him, I've healed you of this hay fever. I've healed you of these allergies. I've healed you. It's finished. It's done. I want you to stand on it and claim it and believe me. Well, he was absolutely confident that he had heard from God. It was as clear as anything. However, he didn't see any evidence. He was, he, 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 nevertheless, it was so clear to him that he went into the church that morning and he said, brethren, actually it was more like brethren, because he's all stuffed up. I have a wonderful announcement to make. <coughs> Jesus has healed me. <coughs> of this terrible hay fever. And he just saw the people go, oh. All over the church, he, he, he said, and they were, like, they were all like, oh no. A crazy pastor is into this stuff again. What's going on? He saw it. It was embarrassing to him. It was worse to him than even the hay fever was. And, and so he went home that day and he prayed and said, Lord, I thought you told me you've healed me. God said, I have healed you. God told him, I want you to announce it to church every Sunday. So he went into, he went, he did that and he went through this trial of faith and he put that little Methodist church through a trial of faith. He announced it every week. He had families that came to him in the church and said, we're leaving the church if you don't quit announcing that because nothing's happening here. He said, well, I can't choose between you and what God told me to do. I I'm sorry. And, and he lost families in his church. His district superintendent called him and said, you've got to quit announcing that. Dr. Rutley said, let me ask you a question, sir. I believe God has told me to announce this. Shall I obey you or obey God? And the two superintendent said, you're just not going to make it in that church if you keep doing this. Well, all the while, uh, this happened in the fall. And all the while, that whole fall, he kept making this announcement and he saw no improvement. The spring came and he felt the Lord say, do it again. And you know what? That spring it was remarkably better than it, than it had been, but it was not gone. Fall rolled around and the Lord said, do it again. And by the end of the hay fever season that fall, it was gone and it stayed gone. It was a wonderful, miraculous healing, but it was a miracle that did not happen in a moment. It happened over a period of 18 months of Dr. Rutland trying to claim to that promise of healing from God. 
That's the oper operation of faith where you, you get into it and you hold on to your faith. And God may call you to that from time to time, but you can't lay that on somebody else as if that's the only way that faith operates. That's the mistake a lot of people in our culture are making in the Western world. They're saying the only way faith works is that you have to say, I claim it in the name of Jesus, and then it happens. That's not always the case. Sometimes God says, no, I want you to do that. And other times God does not tell you what he's going to do. Now, let me tell you about another miracle that Dr. Rutland experienced. He, he, he damaged his back and, and his neck playing high school football. By the time he was out of college, he was diagnosed with degenerative disc disease in, by the Northside Orthopedic Clinic in Atlanta, Georgia. They told him, they said, this is the worst case we have ever seen. That crusty old doctor, how many of you know, found out that sometimes specialists can be the ones that have no bedside manner? And he, he looked at him, he said, by the time you're 45, you're going to be in a wheelchair. Mark it. They gave him some sort of traction device back in the day that it had a neck brace and a collar, as he described it, and, and they had ropes that ran up over a door with sandbags that hung on the other side. And he'd have to sit there by the door, with those handbags hanging on in this sort of traction device. And he'd have to sit there hour after hour. He'd get up at five o'clock in the morning on Sunday morning, put those sandbags over the door, put that collar on and, and just sit there. And then he'd take them down just in time to walk across the street and preach at his little church. And by the time he was finished preaching, everything had sort of settled back into where it was. And, it, and he'd have this blinding headache every Sunday. He was just in terrible, terrible pain. Well, in response to that, he tried to do the same thing he did with a hay fever. He said, I'm going to believe God. I'm going to just confess this. But, but the Lord said to him, I'm not going to do it that way this time. I'm not going to do it that way this time. You see, now faith means that God has the right to do it, this miracle differently than he did the previous miracle. Have you ever noticed that? Have you read the Gospels and how... Jesus, he healed many different people, uh, blindness, for example, but he did it a different way every time. I think, I think that's one of the reasons why uh, he did it was because he knew our, our tendency to create formulas out of everything. So if he had, if he had only used, uh, you know, spat on the ground and used mud on, on a blind uh, person's eyes to heal them, we would, we would have the you know, first church of the, of the mud eyes you know, <laughs> congregation somewhere out there. And we would say, this is how you do it. This is the formula. But Jesus is like, no, there's no formula. I do it my way every time. You just got to learn to listen to me. Well, anyway, God said, I'm going to do it differently this time. And uh, he said, well, Lord, what about the hay fever? He, he, and God said, that was hay fever. I have a different plan here. He said, what should I do, Lord? And God said, use the sandbags until I reveal my plans. Dr. Rutland, you know, he was embarrassed. He wanted to be this man of faith, and, and he didn't tell anybody else in the church about it. He went to a prayer meeting one night where he was supposed to speak, and there was about nine or ten elderly ladies, spirit-filled women of God in their 70s and 80s, and one woman in her 90s. And he never told anybody in the church. He, he had pled with his wife not to tell anyone about the situation. Well, he went to that prayer meeting that night, and he was in pain. His neck was hurting. He went in and one of those old ladies looked at him and said, Pastor Mark, you don't look well. How many of you know you're in a bad place when your pain causes other people to look at you and say, you don't look good. Of course, it's really bad when somebody says, you don't look good and you feel great. That's a, that's a really bad situation then. You don't know what to do. It's like, well, thank you, I guess. But anyway, she said, Pastor Mark, you, you, you don't look very good. You don't look well. And he said, well, I haven't told anybody. He said, I have spinal problems that are very, very bad, and I'm in pain all the time. It's just constant. And those old ladies looked at him and said, kneel down. <laughs> and they, they got, he got down on the floor, and buddy, those old ladies got out on him like buzzards on roadkill. You know what I'm talking about? They jumped on him and they prayed. And listen, they, they, I'm going to have a little fun. They, 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 they weren't praying in faith. They were just ordering God around is what they were doing. They said, this is our pastor. Do something. Well, they prayed. And I'm going to tell you something. If you're sick or if you're hurting, you, you, you need to get a bunch of old ladies that know God. The person you, you want praying for you when you're sick is somebody that understands now faith. 
Well, those, those old ladies got in there with God and they, and they just made a scene. You know, the angel at the, at the door said, you're going to have to make an appointment. And those old ladies said, oh, yeah, I'm coming in. <laughs> you know, that's kind of that kind of situation. And I've been knowing the Lord for 80 years. Appointment this, buddy. And, and, and they got in there and they just started praying and asking God and just pleading with God. And, and he had never been prayed for like that. Well, they prayed about 15 or 20 minutes and Dr. Rutland said that his head and his shoulders and his back and his neck just uh, became engulfed in heat. He said it was like somebody pouring burning gasoline over him. And you know, in that moment, the pain went away. He went back to the Northside Orthopedic Clinic the very next day and got x-rayed. The doctor came out and Dr. Rutland said he could see the fear of malpractice written all over his face. He came out with two sets of x-rays. He said, now, Mr. Rutland, I, I don't know what to say to you, but I hope you can accept my apology uh, that we're not going to have any ramifications from this. Ramifications means malpractice suit, by the way. And he said, your first diagnosis was made based on bad x- x-rays. He said, here's the x-ray from which we diagnosed you and and he said, evidently, it's somebody else's spine. We got the x-rays mixed up somehow. He said, this, this is today's x-ray, and you have no sign of degenerative disc disease. He said, evidently, we made the diagnosis on bad x-rays. And, the, and Dr. Rutland said, yeah, well, you know what? I had pain. The, 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 all that pain that I had was not from bad x-rays. I didn't get the, the pain after you took the x-rays. I came to you because I was already hurting. And the doctor said, well, I have no explanation for that. Dr. Rutland looked at him and said, sir, I'm not going to let you get away with that. Those are my x-rays. That was my spine. Nine old ladies prayed for me last night, and I've had a miracle from God, and this is me now. That's right. If you're going to give God glory, don't paticate. That doctor looked at him and said, oh, well, whatever makes you happy. <laughs> I'm just trying to say to you that faith is the realm in which we operate and it's active. Now faith is not passive, it's active. And then those moments where God says, speaks to you and you hear from him and you know it's God and you stand in faith in those moments and you say, I believe it, God has said this. I'm, I'm, I'm standing on this in faith. And then there are moments when God just does something miraculous instantly. There will come moments where you get in with God, you hear his voice and you have a witness in your spirit that the answer is on the way and you just believe his promises without wavering. However, friend, there will also come a moment where now faith says, the only thing I know now is who God is. Those times come when you say, I know I've heard from God. I know I'm getting this healing. I know this miracle's coming. And you stand on that. But there are other times when the only thing you know is God is God and God is good. And I'm going to stand on that. Well, here's what, how we're going to close out our time together today. I, I don't know what you may be going through. Uh, I don't know what your circumstance or your s- situation may be. But here's what I do know. I know that God is still God. And I want to pray with you this morning and believe God for miracles in your life. You, and listen, as we pray today, you, you, you may be bringing something to him and you may hear God speak to your spirit today. And, and, he, and he may say to you, I'm doing this. Stand in faith. Proclaim this. Believe it. Just, just live this out. Or you may hear God say, just be patient. and Wait for me to speak. Either way, God is still God. Either way, God is still good. Either way, God is still healer. Either way, God is still our strength. Either way, God is still our provider. Either way, God is the restorer of our souls. Either way, God is still the shepherd who walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death. Either way, my friend, God is still God. I'm going to ask Mary Beth to come. I'm going to ask her, ask her to to lead us in, in uh, some worship song, some worship course. And here's what I want to do to close the service today. It's still not even noon. I'm trying to be mindful of time. 
And so if you've got a roast in the oven, it's not going to burn. All right? I don't know if anybody does that anymore. Anybody put roast in the oven on Sunday? One person? What time should I be there? I love roast. Listen, I'm gonna, we're going to sing. We're going to worship. But today, not that I have any kind of special faith, but I want us to act in now faith. I want to say, you know what, God, I want to pray with whatever, whatever faith you've given me today. And if you speak to me, God, today, and you say, trust me, I got this, and I'm going to do it, I'm going to heal you, I'm going to, I'm going to send this miracle, I'm going to do whatever it may be that's on your heart, then rejoice in that. But today, if you come and you pray and say, Lord, I need this, and he says, I know, just trust me. I got it. I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do, but you know who I am. Either way, I want you to grab hold of God today and I want you to pray in now faith. So today what we're going to do is as Mary Beth leads us in some worship, if you have something on your heart, something that you're praying for, something your heart longs for, and, and you've been, maybe you've been praying about it for, for months or years, maybe it's something that's new that's coming up in your life, but, but you just need God, a, a touch from God. You need a miracle in some way. Maybe it's family members that have stray, strayed away from God. Maybe it's financial situations. There's a lot of people facing that kind of stuff in today's environment. Maybe it's maybe it's a crisis of faith because you prayed for something and, and, it, and it didn't happen. Someone you love passed away. Maybe it's because of a physical uh, touch that you need from God. I don't know what it is and it doesn't matter to me what it is because I can't answer him anyway. But whatever it is, I want to invite you to step out from where you are. I want you to come and I want you to stand. And we're going to pray one for another today with now faith. We're going to just simply say, God, I believe you're God now. You're God in this situation. And whether you answer my request the way that I want you to answer it, I'm here to confess that you are still God. You are still good. And I will trust you. And though you slay me, still I will trust you. So if you have a need, something you'd like prayer for this morning, I want you to, uh, maybe everybody can stand up so it's easier for people to come. And if you have a need, it's something you want to pray for, I'm going to invite you right now without hesitation to come and stand at this altar. We have people moving already. If you need prayer today, listen, now faith. Don't wait. Don't say, well, maybe tomorrow. Maybe, yes, I'll do it someday. But now, come to him now and say, God, I want to pray for this. I want to believe you for this now. Now, faith. And just listen. Let him move. Let him say what he wants to say. Let him do what he wants to do. Just learn to relax and to trust him. To lay back and say, I don't know the answer. I don't know what's going to happen. But I know my Redeemer. I know my God. I know what he can do. And I will trust in him. So Mary Beth, would you lead us and the rest of you? Would you just lift your voice in worship? And maybe you could, you're welcome to come and lay hands on your friends. I would love for you to come and pray for somebody around this altar today so they know they're not standing alone. But I want you to come. I want you to pray. I want you to lift your hands. I want you to worship. And for the next few moments, would you just focus on him? Don't focus on what's, what you're going to do after church. Don't focus on what's going on this afternoon. Don't sit there and wait, wonder, wow, when can can I get out the doors? Instead, will you just stay? Will you just wait on God for a few moments? Will you seek his face? Will you let him do what he wants to do? Will you worship him without worrying about anyone or anything else? Will you do that in this place today? Let's move in now faith and let's pray for the people of God today. Mary Beth, lead us. Let's worship him today.